Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. John Allen Paulus. He is a professor of math at Temple University. He is the author of several books, and today we're going to talk about his most recent one, Who's Counting, Uniting Numbers and Narratives with Stories from Pop Culture, Puzzles, Politics, and More. So, Dr. Paulus, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to everyone. Okay, well, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So, before we get into some of the topics you explore in this collection of essays, I think we could call it just one initial question. What is enumeracy? Because that's, in fact, the title you give to one of your books. Uh, enumeracy is just an inability to deal comfortably with numbers, uh, chance, probability, logic, and, uh, and uh, everything that flows from that. So it's, it's kind of the mathematical analog of illiteracy. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, uh, both of them afflict uh, a large number of people. <laughs> so, getting into one very interesting essay that you included in this book, should presidential candidates be tested with puzzles and why? Where does that idea come from? Well, I mean, a lot of companies test prospective employees by giving them tests, especially high-tech companies, uh, you know, they see, I mean, if they can think logically, if they can solve puzzles, if they kind of uh, are resilient, can think on their feet. And uh, so it's not that unreasonable, uh, not necessarily to require, I don't know if there's any way we could require presidential or candidates or political candidates in general to take a test, but it, it would be nice if there was some um, some way of ascertaining uh, not only their ability to think uh, logically, careful, carefully, but even uh, knowledge of uh, certain basic facts. And um, in, in this country in particular, it, it, uh, it isn't uh, this people who come across as too brainy or whatever don't, don't fare well. I mean, in other countries, I mean, Mec in, uh, you know, Germany, wow. England, uh, people of, of, like, aren't ashamed uh, to uh, say they have a background in science or math. I mean, in Singapore, half the government uh, seems to have so. And Merkel has a PhD or had in Germany and in general. But here it's almost a kiss of death to, um, to come across as scientifically uh, knowledgeable. And... Um, but I mean, that's unfortunate, it's a general cultural phenomenon. But I, I think if uh, th there was a, you know, informal understanding that you have to, you know, if, uh, maybe test isn't a, a good thing because that'll scare people, scare candidates. But uh, some way to ascertain uh, their, one, their knowledge and, you know, some simple puzzles. You want to ask them to solve some, you know, complicated brain teaser. Mm -hmm. So, talking about science itself, what, is, what can be the problem with meta-analysis? I mean, what can go wrong with them? With, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. With meta-analysis. Well, I mean, uh, people are, uh, will become, uh, are oblivious to serious problems because they, they don't get the media attention or they aren't so sexy or whatever. And are, people become obsessed with minor problems that uh, afflict you know, a relative handful of people or in terms of money. I mean, millions, billions, trillions, uh, the words rhyme, but they're vastly different. And, and if you press a, you know, a hot button on something that costs $50 million, that sounds like a, you know, a huge investment, whereas a trillion dollars is, you know, is nothing. I mean, people don't realize that uh, you know, a trillion is a thousand times a billion, which is in turn a thousand times a million. So, uh, you know, incurring uh, some debt of 500 billion kind of that doesn't arouse the same uh, anxiety uh, that uh, spending 50 million dollars does. 
So, and that, that, that's relevant to all kinds of areas. Uh, uh, climate change, people can't put the, the risks into perspective. Can't, in general, balance risks if you don't have a, a kind of feel for, for numbers, generally big numbers, or even small numbers. Sometimes I, I asked my class recently, uh, there's a study that says that, uh, that uh, <clears throat> Uh, most uh, heart attacks, uh, or about 40 some percent of heart attacks, occur on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And they attribute this to the stress of the weekend, and people drink and they party or whatever. So it's, uh, you should be careful because 42 percent of, of heart attacks occur on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And people, you know, oh, got to be careful. But three days of the week is three sevenths of the week which is about 42 percent so you would expect that to be the case so i mean unless you can have some feel for not not just big numbers but small numbers and assess probabilities and uh likelihoods and so on um your law uh, you'll you won't be an effective leader you might be an effective leader because you might be appealing to um <laughs> people who are equally enumerate one thing that was said about bill bill clinton of uh, uh, was that, you know, he was actually a, a very intelligent guy, but he was intelligent enough to realize that he should kind of hide his intelligence and kind of use colloquialism, that dog ain't gonna hunt and whatever. And um, I think to some extent, uh, maybe in general, but maybe more so in this country, you, you have to do that. Mm -hmm. Another interesting thing that you talk about in one of your essays is how can two losing strategies sometimes result in a winning combination? It's uh, it's hard to uh, explain without uh, looking at the uh, the actual game. The, the game involves uh, two games, and uh, you roll a, a die or flip a coin, uh, and if it's some multiple of three, you go up a step. If it's some uh, some other uh, satisfy some other condition, you go down a step, and both of the games played by themselves will will result in you're going steadily down the down the step. You imagine like an infinite staircase, but uh, when you play them uh, alternately or play uh, uh, first one game then the other, it's a strange uh, phenomenon. It's due to Perando, a uh, Spanish uh, physicist. Called Perando's paradox. When you play them in succession, one after the other, uh, you actually, even though each game is a losing game, it's actually uh, results in you're going up this infinite stairway. So, people have been trying to get some sort of practical application of this, let's say in the market, but uh, there the uh, the game isn't as clear cut as it is in this imaginary uh, scenario that Perando came up with. So, so far, except in very extreme cases, uh, there's no real application for that, except it's just kind of an oddity, which is, you know, Perando's paradox. <laughs> yeah. What, uh, what would you say are some of the most common mistakes people make when thinking in probabilities? Well, people uh, Probably just uh, asking themselves, uh, what is, uh, is this a random sample? Is it a reasonable, reasonably random sample? I mean, everybody can go out and ask their friends or look at some uh, kind of partisan uh, uh, website and uh, get the feeling that, you know, their, uh, their particular biases are held by more people than really are the case. I mean, it's confirmation biases uh, at, at Play there, but in general, people have a, have difficulty thinking in terms of uh, probability. Their their notions of, of, of their, uh, probability or their vocabulary for it are very limited. Sometimes it's not much more than one in a million, 50-50, or sure thing. That's that's the extent of their probabilistic vocabulary. So and uh, or some people don't even deal with it at all. I mean, kind of. Certain religious people say, "Well, everything uh, uh, was meant to be, and if, that, if that's what you think, uh, you're not going to be too interested or very knowledgeable about probability." And probability results are often counterintuitive, so that's going to be a problem too. But 
Uh, estimating sample size, I mean, realizing when you've got a random sample or what you have to do, but there's all kinds of uh, little techniques, uh, little ideas uh, that are important. I mean, even just a simple distinction between the risk, between risk and relative risk. Sometimes you read something, um, you know, uh, the relative risk, if you eat bacon, one slice of bacon a week, your relative risk of this kind of cancer goes up 20%. And people can be, you know, terrified by that. But I'm just making up numbers here. But if, um, you know, if five people uh, out of 100,000 get this kind of cancer, and if they eat bacon, if this, uh, and that raises the uh, probability to six per 100,000, that's going up from five to six. It is 20%, but it's still a minuscule risk. Mm -hmm. So there are all sorts of uh, examples where understanding of uh, probability uh, is important. The thing is that probability is just a refinement of everyday notions in whatever natural language you're talking about. Lots of words in English have to do with probability, fate, odds, whatever major or standard deviation is a refinement of words like very different, far out, strange. So uh, probability is kind of a refinement of these everyday notions. Bayes' theorem, too, tells you how precisely to change your estimate of the answer in the light of new information. So, I mean, um, people like Moliere, uh, uh, you know, uh, people have been speaking uh, who said uh, people are surprised they've been speaking prose their whole life. Well, in a way, people speak probability their whole life. They just speak it badly. And uh, probability theory and statistics are a refinement of, uh, of these everyday notions. Mm -hmm. Can mathematics itself help us understand a little bit better where the biases and heuristics that people use that are part of human cognition, uh, why they lead us to these mathematical errors? Uh, yeah, well, it's bound up with not just in uh, mathematical ignorance, but in, as you just mentioned, uh, various cognitive biases, uh, uh, the availability error, things that come to mind when you know, a story is mentioned, they look at, look at similar stories in the past, anchoring effects, uh, confirmation bias, even the conjunction fallacy. As a more, I mean, the conjunction fallacy is the following. It's, it's originally called a Linda problem. You imagine there is this woman, Linda, who's got a PhD in physics, and she was uh, president of her class in college, and she was, you know, written about uh, feminist issues. Okay, given that background for Linda. Is, which of these two options is more, more likely? One, Linda works in a convenience store as a cashier. Or two, Linda works in a convenience store as a cashier and it has organized a, uh, a feminist, uh, national feminist uh, organization. Uh, which of those two things is more likely? And many people would say the latter is more likely. But it turns out that uh, Linda works as a cashier, period, is more likely because it's always easier to satisfy just one condition than two conditions. And the, the probability of satisfying two conditions is always going to be less than satisfying one of them. And that's called uh, the conjunction fallacy. And um, it's relevant even in the internet. Uh, uh, it's very easy to collect a whole bunch of uh, factoids off the internet and weave them, to, weave them together and concoct this ridiculous story. But it is nevertheless plausible. There's a kind of a trade-off between plausibility and probability. Adding more details, like she's the head of this uh, feminist organization, makes the story more plausible, but less probable. So, but, uh, you know, so, but, so a lot of these conspiracy theories uh, do have a superficial plausibility. There are lots of little details that are true, but um, aren't really relevant. So um, in any case, to get back to your thing, uh, mathematics uh, 
probability in particular, other areas as well, combined with common cognitive biases uh, are part of the problem of people seeing things clearly. Mm -hmm. uh, why is it so easy for people to find meaning in random events? Well, people are, as has often been said, kind of pattern-seeking animals. They, they want things to, to make sense and uh, are always searching ways to connect to this or that. I mean, coincidences occur all the time, and the vast majority of them mean absolutely nothing. And uh, But yet, I mean, people... I mean, you can generate them. An example I like is look at the first letters of the of the months in in, uh, in order: January, February, J, F, and so on. You have July, August, September, October, November. The letters spell Jason. Or look at the first letters of the planets: in, in Mercury, Venus, Earth, and so on. You have Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. The first letters spell Sun. Is that a coincidence? I mean, is that meaningful? No, of course not. And uh, there, are, uh, there are patterns, there are coincidences all over the place. And as I say, the vast majority of them don't mean anything. I mean, even if you get, uh, you know, COVID uh, vaccines and people said, oh, look at the blood clots. Yeah, there were blood clots after people received the COVID vaccine. That's true. But uh, not any more than there would be in the same time interval for people who didn't receive it. So uh, it's it's easy to uh, to find meaning when it's not there. Same thing as I just said with the with the internet. Mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, apophenia is a technical not technical term, but a term for seeing things uh, patterns that, that aren't there, and we're all we're all given to that. Uh, since you mentioned COVID vaccination uh, and during the pandemic, of course, we've been exposed to lots and lots of different statistics. What do you think we could learn or could have learned about statistics during the pandemic? I mean, things related to base rates, pooling and sample bias, for example. Right. Um, well, false positives, for one, I mean, uh, you know, false positive tests is one that turns out positive when you don't have the condition. But, um, I mean, and that phenomenon is much more general than COVID. Whenever you test for something that's relatively rare and it's a reasonable test, uh, you're going to have a tremendous percentage of false positives. There are often more false positives than true positives. And the reason is, let's say you're testing for something rare, like being a terrorist, let's say. Happily, being a terrorist is a rare phenomenon. <laughs> but that you have a reasonable psychological profile of terrorists. And uh, and if someone's a terrorist, they'll very likely fit that profile. Uh, but uh, if someone's not a terrorist, they, they might also fit it. And um, there's always a, a very small percentage of a large number so to say, I mean, forget terrorism, a disease, a very small percentage of a large number of healthy people will end up testing positive. Uh, and a large percentage of a small group of people will test positive, uh, true positives. But often the former are, are larger. I mean, uh, uh, false positives are, are more frequent. Uh, it's hard to do. I mean, it's something called radio math or maybe Skype math without without formulas or a blackboard or a paper, it, it, it's hard to digest if you haven't seen it before. But uh, the notion of false positives, how common they are, the fatality rate. Fatality rate in principle is very simple. It's just a fraction. The, the number of deaths divided by the number of people who have the, the disease. But both the numerator and denominator are very nebulous notions. How, how do you know who has it? There, there's not that many uh, accurate, at least in the beginning, uh, people weren't tested in a small number. And even the numerator, the number of deaths, I mean, uh, did the person die of COVID or with COVID from something else? So um, that uh, is uh, a, a problem. 
exponential growth. What's the difference between exponential growth and linear growth? Linear growth it grows by the same amount during each time increment, and exponential growth it grows by the same percentage during each time interval. And the latter case, after a while, it's growing very, very rapidly. So, I mean, people, you know, throw the word around exponentially and often don't really mean what they say. Um, uh, they say something's growing exponentially when it just means it's, it's growing fast. But uh, a lot of these notions are kind of mathematical and people, uh, I think, you know, because of COVID, uh, people do have a kind of keener understanding of a, a few of these, of these notions because they are matters of life and death as are false positives. Yeah. So at least in the US, I know that there are certain places where police departments use AI systems to try to prevent a crime. Right. What might be some of the issues with that? Well, actually, right there is a, a good example of false positives, because uh, uh, if somebody uh, is a criminal, uh, they probably will test positive, so to speak, uh, will fit the profile. But uh, if you, you know, uh, if you ha if you are, um, you know, a criminal, you'll likely fit the profile. But if you aren't, you probably won't fit the profile. But nevertheless, the uh, the number of non-criminals vastly is vastly more than the number of criminals. So a small percentage of non-criminals fitting the profile mm -hmm. might be more numerous than a uh, than a large percentage of criminals fitting it. So you're going to get a lot of false positives. People will be arrested or inconvenienced or uh, and uh, inconveniences at the very least. So, and uh, not only that, the chilling effect of surveillance in general, is, uh, which is getting more and more pervasive, and particularly in China, where it doesn't seem like you can go to the bathroom without uh, the government knowing about it. <laughs> and uh, so uh, uh, that's, I mean, forget about law enforcement, just the, the chilling effect of everybody, uh, at least people knowing everything. I mean. There's a controversy on Twitter now that, um, you know, too many people can see all your tweets and uh, who you're connected with and so on and can possibly use that in some way to embarrass or, uh, you know, manipulate you. Mm -hmm. uh, another interesting thing that I read about in the book, can we learn uh, about the truth from complete liars, that is, people who always lie. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, they're, they're fairly common. Um, well, it, it's hard to be a, a complete liar. In fact, if you had somebody who lied all the time, uh, it would be a very valuable person. You just ask him something, whatever he says, you know, the answer is the opposite. <laughs> so uh, if you find such a person, let me know. But, uh, I mean, there are ways to ask uh, questions that, that derive from kind of paradoxes. If you have somebody who lies all the time and somebody tells the truth all the time, there are questions you can ask. Uh, let's say, does this road lead to the capital? Uh, does this road lead to the capital if and only if you're a truth teller? And uh, both the liars and the truth tellers will answer correctly. So. Um, and there's, you know, uh, other sorts of paradoxes. I, I, the Smallian paradox, uh, there's liars, truth tellers, and people who sometimes tell the truth and sometimes uh, uh, lie. And that's harder. Uh, like you can ask two questions and uh, get the correct answer if you uh, pose them in the, in the right way. Again, radio math, it's hard to get across on uh, without uh, you know, thinking about it in a little sample space, so to speak. But uh, yeah, lying is uh, pervasive. <laughs> there's even a way, I mean, uh, you can generate, uh, if there, there's a class of politicians who um, uh, lie but never tell two lies in a row. So let's look at uh, some sequence of their statements. Uh, it turns out that that sequence, uh, how many such sequences of, the, of statements are there of that sort of a given length? Turns out that's all, always going to be a Fibonacci number, which is odd, right, perhaps. And um, yeah, so uh, liars are, uh, are 
an interesting category. And uh, yeah, you can learn a lot about truth by studying lying. As a number of uh, logical paradoxes, I uh, and the liar paradox is more generally or more specifically I discuss in his counting. Considering the fact that people sometimes lie, is it possible to improve uh, data coming from statistics that involve surveys, for example? Yeah, I mean, there, there are ways to um, uh, determine a percentage of people who will who have done X, where X is something that's illegal or embarrassing. If you ask them, have you ever X, people will often lie. But there's ways to get uh, statistical information about the percentage of people who have X without compromising anybody's personal uh, space, so mm -hmm. to speak. So, for example, uh, you can ask a bunch of people, have you ever X'd? And if you just ask the question baldly like that, they'll, people will lie. But if you tell them, uh, each of these people, let's say there's a thousand people, to secretly flip a coin. And if it lands heads, to just say yes, to answer the question yes, if it lands heads. And if your secret, you know, the, nobody knows the, which way your coin landed, if your coin lands tails, then answer the question truthfully. So again, have you ever X'd? Flip a coin privately, secretly. If it lands heads, say yes. If it lands no, answer truthfully. Uh, people will be much less likely to lie then because there's nothing shameful or embarrassing or illegal about flipping a coin and having it land heads. But if there's a thousand people and you get 560 heads, I mean 560 yeses, uh, uh, that says something, because uh, 500 of them approximately will be because the person flipped the coin and it landed heads. But the other 60, their coins landed tails. So 60 out of that 500, about 12%, uh, uh, have really X. So you have uh, a reasonable statistic. 12% of people have X, but you don't know anything about any individual. And there are refinements of that that's used, that are used by the CIA, by advertisers. Uh, people often don't want to admit that they want this product, but they really do. So there are refinements of that to, to get statistical measures of, um, of some, uh, something without compromising any particular person's uh, desires. Mm -hmm. So for some diseases, at least like cancer, for example, um, doctors tend to provide people with information about five years survival rates. Uh, yeah. Is there some issue with that? Well, it depends. Sometimes, often, um, you know, the screening takes place too early. I, I give an example in the book, which means, let's say there, there's some disease that um, uh, starts manifesting uh, symptoms in the early 60s and then kills people uh, in, the, in a few years. But if you test for it, when people are in the, let's say there's two states, and one state is 100% screening, and they screen people in their 50s, and everybody survives at least five years because it doesn't affect the, the symptoms aren't overt until 60. So if you screen people in their 50s, every, everybody uh, will have uh, satisfy the five-year survival rate. A different state, nobody is screened. And but so when, they, when people turn early 60s, the symptoms come up and they die at the same rate. The state that man, mandates 100% screening, people are still going to die within five years. And the people who don't screen will, of course, die within five years as well. So that, that's uh, like a lot of metrics, uh, doesn't always work. I mean, uh, in, in general, you have to ask when something is defined operationally in some way, is it really measuring what you want it to measure? And, uh, and uh, sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. So again, you have to understand what the metric is uh, intended to do, what it really does. And, uh, and uh, not just in the medical situations, but in other situations as well, um, you, you have to be careful. Does the SAT predict uh, uh, success in college? Well, yes and no, depending on the college. 
Ok, so tell us more about that. Do SAT scores really predict success? Oh yeah, if you look at SAT scores, uh, the tests that uh, kids take in, uh, in high school, uh, achievement tests, um, it doesn't look like there's any strong correlation between uh, their scores and the, the grades they get in college. But that's because colleges in general uh, recruit students, uh, attract students from with a narrow kind of range of, uh, of abilities. And uh, some college will, will attract students that aren't that good, and they'll have the normal distribution of grades, A, B, C, D, F, and other colleges, very the elite colleges, will have the same uh, you know, attract very good students, have the same uh, uh, scores, uh, uh, grades in college, A, B, C, D, F, and uh, the, the distribution of grades in the two colleges will be the same. But that's because they attract students from different populations. If you take a, a, a not, a not very strong students and put them in. Uh, and the least school, that would make a big difference. And then he or she, might a good chance, wouldn't do very well. Or uh, so, I mean, within the colleges, the grade distribution that's argue is more or less the same. But that's because, as I say, they they recruit or attract students from the narrowest swath of the, the spectrum of, of uh, SAT scores. Uh, and if you take one from the top, put it in the bottom, they'll do very well. And you get all A's, and from the bottom put it at the top, they might get all F's or D's. So, uh, uh, again, you can, uh, in, in the book, I talk about a soccer achievement test, and uh, and it might become more, you know, anyway, it's, it's also an SAT. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what I'm saying in the, in the book is, as, as you know, I, mean, I like to tell stories rather than use formulas and equations and gets the idea across and uh, and uh, in a way that people who are averse to math uh, uh, you know, will be drawn into it. Right. Uh, let's get now into some questions surrounding politics and the media. So can we change people's absolute positions on some topics like just to give an example, abortion, which has been a big one this year, uh, with mathematics. Uh, no, well, no, but there are there is a, a kind of. I mean, you you can cite statistics, but uh, no, that uh, but the, the example. I mean, the breaking down an absolute resistance to all abortion. Uh, yeah, there, there is a, a story I like that uh, I think is relevant. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, imagine if, if two things about the world changed. Uh, one is um, because of some natural environment, uh, toxic environment, and uh, whatever uh, uh, winds, the uh, uh, radioactivity. Uh, Women got uh, a woman who became pregnant would become pregnant with 10 to 20 fetuses at a time because of these uh, these conditions, which you know, toxicity in the environment for one. Okay, so women now, if they become pregnant, become pregnant with 10 to 20 fetuses at a time, and the other is advances in in nanotechnology and uh, and uh, um, natal care, prenatal care, uh, doctors can now, if they intervene early, can save some or all of these 10 to 20 fetuses. So, uh, uh, any, someone who's absolutely against abortion in all situations now has a, a bit of a dilemma, because if they maintain that absolutist position, uh, they have to uh, uh, realize it'll result in a 10 to 20 fold increase in, in births and um, and what that will will do and they can't say well just save some of them because that will be tantamount to abortion of the others so uh, there, if someone you know they, this argument which is not a knockdown argument although you might be knocked down if you're giving it in some places uh, 
uh, is such that, you know, if, well, once you get somebody to admit, yeah, okay, I, I don't want that, somebody who's absolutist in their opposition to all abortion, uh, once they, you know, say, okay, in that situation, I would do that, well, then you've opened up the gates and they're, they're no longer absolutists. There's a, a joke that's marginally relevant that uh, George Bernard Shaw was at a very posh dinner party and uh, some woman sitting next to him, he was sitting next to some woman and he asked her if uh, she would have sex with him for a million pounds. And she said, why, of course, and she laughed. And then he says, well, would you have sex with me for 10 pounds? <laughs> and, and she said, why, what do you think I am? She was very indignant. He says, well, that's been established. Now we're just haggling about the price. So, <laughs> so once you, kind of, yeah, I mean, it's a sexist, marginally relevant thing, but when, once you, you know, admit a certain principle is no longer absolute, it's, it's you know, the, everything after that is haggling about the price or haggling about the conditions for an abortion. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's not exactly mathematics proving anything, but uh, it's, uh, it's on the borderline, so to speak. Can we understand a phenomenon like political polarization with mathematics? Yeah, well, one, uh, there are a number of articles, I mean, columns I discuss in the, in the book. One is uh, Wolf's Dilemma, and it's um, a real life kind of instantiation of the following. And let's say there's a, a billionaire, and he uh, says, uh, I'll give. Uh, uh, 10, 10, 000, no, I'll give you $100,000 to anybody who does not press a little button on their desk secretly. Okay, so everybody, there's a bunch of people sitting in a room, there's a button in front of them, nobody knows if you press the button or not. And he says, I'll give $100,000 if no one in this classroom presses a button. But if somebody does, uh, the people who do will get $5,000, not 100000 and the people who don't will get nothing. So, uh, so there's an incentive not to press a button because you get $100,000, but somebody might because they're afraid that they'll be betrayed. So in any case, uh, the, the higher the payoff, the more likely it is that no one will press a button. Uh, that's sort of relevant to the uh, lockstep nature of Republicans during the last couple of years, Republicans in the United States who are very partisan and stick together. Because if they all stick together, they get the big benefit, not $100,000, but they get to remain in power, they get all the perks, and, um, and that's a, a huge payoff. But if some of them defect, and, and uh, say, yeah, what the Republicans are doing is bad or whatever, or I'm not going to support that particular issue, I'm not going to do that. Once the, the majority breaks, cracks, it might further break. And the people who do that, the Republicans who do that, will get a smaller reward. They might be lionized, praised in the, in the, uh, in the press by in liberal newspapers and journals. But... Uh, uh, it's they probably won't. They'll probably stick together because of the huge payoffs. And um, I mean, Wolf's dilemma is kind of a multi-person prisoner's dilemma. And uh, it's um, you know it's one reason Republicans. I mean, sometimes it happens with Democrats, but in recent decades, it's been Republicans. And um, yeah, so that's uh, relevant. It's, it's also relevant to uh, you know why why. So many, given we talk, I'm talking about politics, why so many uh, people like, continue to deny that the election was fair, that mm -hmm. they continue to deny that, you know, deny that, and, and uh, have swallowed Trump and other people's things. But there's a, a quote I, by, Mark, uh, by uh, Mark Twain that is relevant, it says, it's much easier to con people, fool people, much easier to con people than it is to convince them that they've been conned. Once they've made a, <laughs> made a decision, it's very hard to, to go back. I mean, so it related to uh, Brandolini's bullshit principle, it's much easier to, uh, to construct 
stupid stories, uh, I've got a bullshit to use his word, than, than it is to deconstruct them, to refute them. And uh, it's kind of a political version of the thermo, uh, law of thermodynamics. But um, uh, that's, a, that's another factor. I mean, once somebody publicly says something, it's hard to get them to go back, and their whole identity is vested in showing that they, they're right, that the election was stolen, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so to quote you now, and still in the domain of politics, at a certain point in the book you say, people are conformist and all politics is local which suggests incidentally that political issues and disputes have a fractal structure. So, I mean, with this in mind, does it matter that much if people are well informed on political issues or not? Because that's something that people like political scientists and political philosophers tend to worry about a lot. Uh, that's a good question. I mean, I'd like to think, yeah, it does matter. Um, because uh, people who are informed, arguably at least, if, I'm, I'm not certain, but arguably at least, are, are, least, are less, you know, are, are harder to, uh, to bamboozle, a, easier to uh, assemble into a cult if they don't, can't think critically or outside the box or outside what their, their uh, local politician or local religious leader says. So if you're if you're gullible, uh, argu the argument is you're much easier to lead and uh, uh, much uh, more likely for some kind of dictator, charismatic dictator, to arise. But uh, <clears throat> I hope that's the case. I think it is the case. But there is you know an argument you could make that as, as you just said, uh, you know, if uh, people if, even if everybody's informed, there's going to be you know developments. Uh, at a higher level that take place at the, the same as in the local school board and you're still going to get these kinds of things and, and I mean look at um, you know I mean Germany I mean was an educated country and yet it gave rise to Hitler and uh, lots of smart people in Russia I mean I think, you know look at uh, Putin and uh, Brazil I mean all these examples and Bolsonaro was elected um, so um, uh, well, it, Brazil isn't so highly educated, but uh, I mean, there's a lots of uh, educated people, but broadly, whereas Germany, and well, especially Germany, not so much Russia. So it's not clear that it's true, but as I say, I'd like it to be true. I guess everybody would well, I don't know. Maybe it's a bias, maybe, I don't know. I mean, uh, William F. Buckley, uh, uh, this conservative commentator from years ago, once said that if you took uh, 100 people out of uh, phone book uh, at random, they do just as good a job in the U.S. Senate as the present set of senators. And uh, I, don't know. I don't know, I don't think that's true, but uh, there is an element of truth to it. <laughs> <laughs> Can we use mathematics to better understand where certain religious beliefs come from? Uh, I, I don't know. I. Uh, I, I did, I, I wrote a book entitled Irreligion, in which I kind of outlined the, the standard uh, arguments for existence of God and uh, pointed out the, the logical gaps in all of them. And, uh, and again, I think if, uh, I mean, the reason, I don't know, a lot of people believe in God is uh, that uh, he, he, says in the, <laughs> he says he exists in the book that he inspired allegedly inspired, which is hardly an argument. So um, so it's not exactly uh, math, uh, mathematics proper, but uh, there are, you know, logical gaping holes that are obvious to, to uh, 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 sometimes not so obvious in all of the standard arguments for the existence of God. And um, if you want to choose to believe, fine, but, um, uh, you know, I, I don't have, I shouldn't be bound by what, uh, by your particular religious beliefs. You can believe what you want as long as it doesn't uh, directly affect me. But, uh, yeah, so uh, in, in that sense, again, I mean, I, my conception of mathematics is broader than that of most people. It's um, a lot of my work has to do with 
you know, not, not the subtitle of this book, Uniting Narratives and Math. I talked about math and humor, the similarities uh, which aren't so obvious between mathematics and humor. And, um, uh, you know, they're, they're both logical, uh, although one is illogical, they both deal with patterns, they both uh, depend on uh, the punchline is an aha moment in, uh, in math, or the punchline in humor. And uh, we dip the odd absurd and plays a role in both, although in one case it's for the sake of the absurdum, in the other case it's to uh, prove things or disprove things. So, uh, and I wrote a book entitled, I Think Therefore I Laugh, which is an exemplification of a remark by Wittgenstein that you could write a good and serious book that consists of, uh, of jokes, uh, jokes broadly conceived. If you get the joke, you get the relevant philosophical point. And, um, and puzzles also, I, I talk about puzzles in, in this book, some puzzles that generally have a kind of real world uh, significance but are, you know, kind of interesting in their own right. And puzzles also are on this continuum of math and humor and so on. Uh, uh, they're more substantial than jokes, but they're not quite mathematics, but they're, they're certainly relevant, that kind of mathematics. So, um, uh, it, so with this broader conception of mathematics, in, in that sense, yeah, I think math is relevant to religion, math is relevant to politics, and. Uh, stock market, things that you, you know, any part of your daily life. Mm -hmm. So these specifically might also have something to do with religious beliefs and practices. Earlier we talked about, for example, how people attribute meaning to random events. What about attributing meaning to numbers? Why and how do people do that? Uh, well, we, I'm not sure I understand. Uh, I mean, uh, attributing meaning to numbers. So, you mean like how the, how does that happen? Why is it that, for example, people, for some reason, focus on a particular number and they think oh, it has some meaning? Right. Well, I mean, yeah, there's a long tradition in numerology, the significance of certain numbers, six six six, and uh, mm -hmm. or, uh, but uh, again, I mean, nine eleven. Uh, has a kind of status now, but uh, in one of my essays, I talk about how many 9/11, uh, how many situations can be described by 9/11 that come up naturally. I mean, the very day of the thing, this American quarterback Johnny Unitas died. He, it was nine was here and eleven there, and there's all, uh, all kinds of. I don't even remember, but the, this was 22 years ago or so. Uh, 21. But, uh, you know, the numbers, be, people kind of fetishize numbers, as, as you said, and there's, uh, you know, gematria, different uh, sorts of uh, numerical significance in, in the Bible from uh, uh, Greek traditions, Jewish traditions, others as well. And uh, again, it's, a, it's, um, it's a, a, in some sense, a case of apophenia, a kind of uh, uh, focusing on uh, trying to make sense of things and oh what unites this this and that on ah, 911 or uh, 666 oh well look at this so I mean that it's uh, for many people I think it provides a kind of anchor I mean like how we know those numbers are bad 13 is bad uh, Friday the 13th is particularly bad <laughs> so yeah it's like a lot of uh, superstitions mm -hmm. So, one last in, question. In, in fact, a, a number of people have said, oh, I liked your book on numerology, which is just the opposite. <laughs> I mean, numerology, <laughs> it's not numerology. I'm against numerology, <laughs> but uh, I'm sorry. No, no problem. So, one last question, and perhaps uh, this book of yours is a good example of that, but since mathematics in general tends to be so counterintuitive to most people, is it possible or do you think it's possible to make people like and appreciate mathematics more? Yeah, I think it is. I think uh, it depends on, on a lot of things, but on how it's taught. And uh, I mean, once people are adults, I think, you know, story, you know, I'm biased, of course, but uh, 
the way I approach math in, in numeracy and uh, and this book, Who's Counting, via vignettes and stories, it's one way to, to get across uh, mathematical ideas without arousing this kind of instinctive fear or distaste for mathematics. But uh, I think uh, the way it's taught, getting people to work together, maybe not the, the, the straight lecture uh, where it's teachers at the board and kids have to memorize stuff. And then emphasizing understanding rather than, you know, rote behaviors. And uh, I mean, uh, as I've written, I mean, uh, mathematics probably has as much to do with computation as literature has to do with typing. Nobody says, oh, you're a good typist. Uh, why don't you write a novel? Or you're a bad typist. Forget that novel. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so uh, a broader conception of math, a, a kind of realization is related to all sorts of things, getting kids hands on. I mean, if all you ever did in English class from middle school, grade school, high school was diagram sentences and study grammar, it wouldn't be real surprising if when you got to college, you didn't have a keen appreciation for literature. You probably wouldn't. But, you know, I'm speaking hyperbolically here, but to some extent, uh, that's the situation in math you you study you know you know times tables you study uh, factoring polynomials you study uh, taking derivatives of a hundred different functions but you don't get to the kind of literature of mathematics big ideas that are really intriguing because you're stuck in this lower level stuff so uh, I think mathematics can be made much more appealing and um, you know, I, I, for for now, if you're really talented, you don't need that stuff. I mean, uh, education is, as has been said, is most effective when it's least needed. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but nevertheless, I think uh, you know, people in general can be uh, uh, grow to appreciate at least uh, mathematics. Great. So the book is again, Who's Counting? Uniting Numbers and Narratives with Stories from Pop Culture, Puzzles, Politics and More. I will be leaving a link to it in the description box of the interview. Uh, Dr. Paulus, just before we go, would you like to tell people where they can find you and your work on the internet? Uh, yes, I could. Uh... Look at look up my webpage, John Allen Pauls, uh, A L L E N is my middle name, John Allen Pauls dot com, and uh, or if they're interested, in my Twitter feed at John Allen Pauls, and um, or look at uh, my books, all of which uh, are available at all kinds of bookstores as well as Amazon. Uh, so. Yeah, thanks for that question. <laughs> and for, no, and thank you for your time and for the book, which was really fascinating. I appreciate your kind words and I enjoyed our interview. Thank you. Hi, guys. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing and to keep the channel sustainable, please consider supporting me on Patreon or PayPal. All of the links are in the description box of this interview. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like, and hit the subscription button. The show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check the website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke and Blanchett, Perga Larson, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunder, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Wittingberg, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Ian Riccolani, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Ruth Gervoz, Wo Weingard, Rebecca Neuberger, Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegar, Rui Narcio, Arthur Co, Zuc, Mark Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Columbus, Jorge Pinha, Phil Cavanagh, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Michael Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Uni, Alexander Dunbauer, Fergal Cusson, Ivan Bodrin, Kuala Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrand, Aslan Bullet, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W. John Weira, Tom Hamel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Dej Araujo, Romain Roach, Dermitri Gregoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punter, Adana Rosmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostazewski, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, 
Gary G. Hellman, João Linhares, Lida Cosmidis, Saima Afzal, Adrian Gage, Nick Golden, Paulo Tolentino, João Barbosa, Jules Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litzke, Dennis Cook, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Todd Shackleford, Sunny Smith and John Wisman, my producers Isar Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafiniak, Luis Keetan, Tom Wagner, Dan Curtis Dixon, John Linares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Giddy, Sardus Francis, Thomas Trumbull and Nuno Welder, and my executive producers Michel Rugieski, Rosie, James Pratt, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Codriano and Bogdan Canivet. Thank you for all.